You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an in-depth look at a range of topics that matter most to business leaders. In this series, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this series. Today, we're gonna to talk about the US economy and what's going on with the leading economic indicators, with the Fed, and what's ahead from a recession perspective. On Wednesday, the Fed announced another rate hike in its latest attempt to quash inflation. And today, the Conference Board released its US Leading Economic Index, or LEI, Question is, what does all this mean for the U.S. economy and the looming recession, and what should businesses be doing? Joining me today is Eric Lund, the Principal Economist at the Conference Board. Eric, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Let's just start, Eric, by talking about the Conference Board's latest LEI, Leading Economic Indicators, report. What did it say? We got the most recent LEI out earlier this morning. It's for the month of August. And what we saw was a 0.3% decline uh, in the index uh, for the month, which is actually below what the consensus estimate was going to be for the uh, the LEI. This is the sixth consecutive decline that we've seen uh, in a row. Uh, and the index is down about 2.7% from uh, where it started the, uh, the descent in February. Uh, in terms of the components, uh, there was softness in, in most of the pieces of the LEI, including building permits, uh, consumer expectations about economic conditions, average manufacturing work a week, um, and softness in uh, manufacturing new orders. There's only a couple of bright spots uh, in the components, which basically are, are uh, associated with the labor market. Um, and we did have a, a little bit of a positive contribution this month from the yield spreads. Okay, so, you know, just not everybody who's listening uh, is an economist. So just you know, what's the relevance of this, LEI? What does, what does this mean? What, are, what does the leading economic indicator suggest? It's really a, it's a basket of measures, right, that, sure. that give us an indication as to which direction the economy is headed. That's essentially in layman's terms what it is, right? Oh, absolutely. So what we do is we, we stitch together a, a series of um, of data points that have some sort of forward-looking component to them. For instance, uh, building starts or or residential uh, housing permits. These have a sort of forward-looking uh, element to them in terms of what kind of economic activity is going to occur six to nine months into the future. And so we look at about 10 of these all together for the U.S. economy to give us a sense of what kind of economic growth might we be seeing around the corner. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier on, the message that it's giving us is, is one that, that is concerning. It, it is indicative of, of a downturn. Yeah, and the, the reason that you look at a whole basket or a a conglomeration of these into one measure is because, you know, any one of these 10 might look good at the mo at one moment, but, and, you know, a couple others bad. So then the question is how does, because the economy is very complex. So it attempts to, to model where the economy is going and just give it in, in one number. But you, what you said is that this is the, what'd you say, the sixth consecutive month of decline, which that's a long period of decline, right? So that, that really is starting to indicate that the recession is is coming, I guess, right? No, absolutely. So, you know, there's a couple of different sort of warnings that, that are triggered by the LEI that we pay attention to. Uh, you hit the nail uh, on the head uh, in terms of the, the length of the decline that we've been seeing. We've been seeing a contraction from one month to the next uh, for six consecutive months. When that happens, it triggers one of our alarms. Uh, one of the other alarms that, that has been triggered uh, just this month is that uh, the majority of the components are going down. So it is a broad-based uh, decline that we're seeing in various pockets of the economy. Each indicator we pick, we pick for a reason because we want to gauge what's happening across the entire economy. And at this point, this is, this is a, a recession warning is flashing from all of the, the relevant sort of parts of, of the indicator. You know, this may not be a perfect metaphor, but it kind of feels like a slow moving train wreck. I mean, you, we're sitting here looking up the track. You see this great freight train, this huge, heavy freight train coming at us. It's been coming at us for a while. It's slow, 
but it is coming at us. And so we can sit here in the sunshine and have a picnic on the tracks, but eventually it's going to be here, right? So, I mean, this is like the calm before a, you know, before a hurricane, you know, it's coming, but it, there's fury in this, in this economic storm. You know, and with the train metaphor, I think that's a great way of putting it. You know, the, the train has been honking the horn down the tracks and it's getting louder and louder. And now it's, it's very, very loud. Uh, we're, we're definitely expecting a recession to probably begin uh, imminently uh, if, if it hasn't already uh, started to occur. Right, so if you were running, you know, an American business and you, you saw this freight train coming at you, you know, what, what are you suggesting that businesses do at this point? Well, I mean, I think businesses need to prepare. They need to prepare for uh, consumers to uh, uh, push back a little bit. The consumer spending were expected to go down. Um, interest rates will continue to rise as the Fed tries to confront the, the big inflation problem that we've been wrestling with for over a year at this point now. Um, and so I think, you know, businesses need to uh, be mindful of, you know, what their financials look like. They need to keep their powder dry um, and prepare for uh, uh, the, the train to, to, to arrive. Yeah. And, you know, there, you've uh, said before and you've written that no two recessions are the same. I don't know, what has it been, about 13 uh, recessions, post-World War II recessions, but no two are the same. So it's interesting sometimes to look back and say, well, this, you know, in this recession, you know, we had to do this and in this recession, but because no two are the same, it's really hard to just say, let's do what we did last time, right? So how is this coming recession different from what you've seen in the past? That's a really interesting uh, uh, point. Um, to a certain extent, you know, when, when people hear the word recession right now, they, they you know, associate it with their most recent experiences. Uh, and our most two most recent experiences were, was the pandemic recession in 2020, which was extremely severe uh, in a very short period of time. And then the great financial crisis, which happened you know, 13 years ago or so at, at, at this point, um, which was a very long drawn out recession that took a long time to recover from. At present, what we're currently expecting is something probably a little bit milder uh, a little bit shorter in duration. And given the tightness that we have seen uh, in the labor market sort of running into the recession, we're not expecting a, a, a big sort of reversal in terms of unemployment uh, and massive job uh, losses. So at present, we're, we're thinking it's going to be a little bit more of a job full recession that's not quite as acute um, or as long as, as some of the, the more recent recessions that we've seen. Well, and that's an interesting point because most recessions become very painful for the consumer, right? And and for jobs. And in, in the conference board's latest consumer confidence index, actually the numbers went up. So consumers, you know, after a couple months decline, consumers are not feeling too badly here about the situation. And that's because their their jobs are intact. And and so that's a little different situation. And you have a what, 11 million job openings still at this point. So the, uh, that and this is real. That's why you know. You, I guess the the job full uh, title. I've never heard that before uh, used in previous recessions. But that's that's a real difference here. It is. You know, and it's interesting with the consumer confidence uh, uh, survey that that you, you talked about. You're right. You know, the the consumers are. are currently reporting that their present situation has not deteriorated, um, but their outlook, right, their expectations about the future, those have plummeted. Um, and I think, you know, their, their chief worry at this point is really the erosion of their buying power. It's the inflation rates, it's the gas prices that they've been having to, to, to confront. Um, and that's really behind really a lot of the slowdown. I think that, that that's ahead of us is the Fed's attempts to try to tackle this and to, to try to arrest inflation and how that's uh, that's going to play out in terms of an economic slowdown. Yeah, we'll come back to the Fed. But, you know, in terms of inflation, you know, the the basics of every consumer budget is food and, and fuel, right? I mean, you have to have food to, for obvious reasons, but you also you need fuel to get to work or get to school. So these are the two components that have been, you know, the most inflationary. Now we've had a what, almost 100 days worth of decline in gas prices, which is good, but 
uh, food continues to go up at, at double digits. So it is interesting that the consumer confidence index kind of is holding. Now, juxtapose that to the CEO confidence index. And what is that telling us? I mean, the CEO confidence uh, index is a lot more bearish than the, the consumers. Um, I think about 93% of the CEOs in our survey um, expect some kind of recession uh, in the future. Uh, fortunately, uh, most of them are expecting that to be mild uh, and, and short in duration. Um, so, you know, they, I find CEOs have to think ahead further. They have to really grapple with financial markets and, and a lot of, a lot of elements, uh, maybe that the consumer isn't really worried about as much. So, uh, I think it's important to, to sort of weigh that one heavily in terms of how you're thinking about the outlook. So it's, you know, we're nearly into the fourth quarter, uh, holiday season is a huge, important season for retail and consumer spending. And obviously then. Uh, GDP, nearly what, 70% of the GDP is the consumer. And so this is a really important season. Any insights, you know, as, as this thing is sliding, as this freight train is coming at us, any insights as to whether this season is going to hold up? Well, I mean, so we track pretty closely uh, retail sales data on a monthly basis and another uh, a spending metric called personal consumption expenditures. And those have been growing sort of at the top line in, in sort of nominal terms, not in inflation adjusted. But when you when you deflate them and you look at them, the growth rate is a little bit weaker. Uh, we expect it to turn negative probably over, over uh, the next couple of months. So we're a little bit cautious about spending over the holiday se season. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about the U.S., leading economic indicators, which is splashing recession. We've talked about the consumer confidence and the CEO confidence. Next, we're going to discuss the recent actions taken by the Fed and future actions, which they have signaled. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the volatile and uncertain economy, the award-winning forecast team at the conference board predicts a downturn by the end of 2022. Recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the conference board has always done, we are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges. To find out how you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side, visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession, located at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board. And we're talking today with Eric Lund, uh, our senior economist, about the state of the current economy. Okay, Eric, the Fed has been on a tear here. What, what have we seen so far? How many rate increases have we seen and where are we? So it's been a, a pretty interesting, really, last couple of years. Um, leading into the, uh, the pandemic, we saw the Fed funds rate drop from about 2.4% all the way down to basically as close to zero as they could get. Um, and they did that, of course, to try to support the economy, uh, to try to uh, uh, moderate the severity of, of, of the pandemic and its impact on, on families and, and businesses across the country. But as a function of that, uh, we started to see inflation pick up in 2021. It took a little while for the Fed to kind of uh, uh, start to, to pull out its, its, its saber, uh, but it finally did in March of this year, uh, when it started to raise hikes. And so basically what we've seen since March uh, is the Fed uh, hiking about 300 basis points at this point, including the 75 basis point hike that we saw yesterday to bring the Fed funds rate all the way up to 3.1%. Yeah, now this is, um, this is a different uh, period of time. So there's something else that's going on and that is the use of the Fed balance sheet. Following the financial crisis, the Fed engaged in something that you've written a lot about called quantitative easing, which you've described as them essentially bringing uh, debt, mortgage-backed securities and, and government debt onto their balance sheet. And I think the, that that Fed balance sheet, what did they hit, eight, eight trillion or something like that uh, at its peak. Now they've said that they're going to Ease. In other words, they're going to work some of that off their balance sheet. So you have two levers at the Fed, the discount rate, which impacts interest rates, and now quantitative tightening. 
talk, this is the first time in history, right? That that's ever happened where we, they've had both of those tools moving together. How do you see the two interacting and how do you see this as a different cycle? So, I mean, the, the two tools that the Fed that you talked about, uh, quantitative easing and, and Fed funds uh, uh, rates, you know, they both in, impact interest rates. They, they typically, the, the Fed funds rate impacts shorter term uh, interest rates uh, more rapidly. So, you know, a three month uh, or a six month or a one year uh, kind of debt instrument. While when, when the Fed utilizes quantitative easing or quantitative tightening, it tends to impact um, basically interest rates that are further out in duration. So by quant using quantitative tightening, by unwinding some of the, the massive purchases that they made uh, over the course of the pandemic, it's going to put upward pressure on some of the longer duration kind of debt instruments uh, that, are, that are out there. And it's also going to reduce the, the size of the U.S. money supply as well. That's an interesting thing, because there's something called an inverted yield curve, where short-term rates, two-year rates, are actually higher than the 10-year rates. That doesn't happen very often, but I think you said that that sometimes, you know, when that happens, it flashes news that recession is coming. And are we sitting, you know, where is that sitting right now? Are we in an inverted position? Sure. It really depends. There's a couple of different kind of inversion metrics that you can use. You can compare different duration uh, uh, rates. So one, one of the ones that we look at the, at the conference board and that's embedded into our leading economic index is I believe the 10 year versus the, uh, the Fed funds rate, uh, which is flashing in inversion right now, I believe. There is a, a history of yield curve inversions that do typically precede uh, a recession. So regardless of whether you're looking at the 10-year versus the, the Fed funds or the 20 versus the 10, at various points over the last six to nine months, a variety of these have been have been inverting. Uh, and so I think the message is, is, is regardless of which one you're looking at in particular, uh, there have been warnings associated with these yield curve inversions for a number of months now. Yeah. Okay. And that's the important thing because, you know, economists look at all of these metrics, it, it, you know, in, in trying to determine where things are going. So this is just one more. Okay. Back to the F Fed funds rate. As of the move yesterday, they're, they're at what, three and a, what'd you say? Three and a quarter, a little higher maybe. Yeah. Um, it, but they also talked about, you know, they were, they were kind of negative on, on, you know, their projections here and where it was going. Talk about, um, you know, your, what they said in the predictions for, say, end of 2022 and then the end of 2023 for the Fed funds rate. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, you're right, Steve. You know, in terms of the actual actions that the Fed took yesterday in terms of the 75 basis point hike, that was sort of widely expected by the markets. It didn't really change anybody's mind about anything. What was different was sort of the tone and the outlook uh, that was painted uh, by the Fed and members of the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the committee that make the, the rate change decisions. What they produce on uh, usually every two meetings or so is something, something called the Summary of Economic Projections. And this is sort of an outlook for what they think rates are going to do over the next couple of years, what they think the economy is going to do in inflation. And the picture that the SEP painted uh, this meeting was a lot starker uh, than what we had seen uh, in the June SEP, which is the last version that came out. Um, for instance, uh, their expectations about economic growth were a lot uh, dimmer uh, than what they had been thinking about uh, over the summer. Their expectations about inflation uh, were much more problematic. The Fed's own members don't expect the Fed to hit the 2% inflation target that they're aiming for, probably until 2024, uh, which is a, a ways out. But one of the biggest things that caught our attention was their expectations about uh, uh, future interest rate hikes. Um, so at this point, uh, they're expecting the Fed funds rate to climb to about 4.4% by the end of this year and 4.6% by the end of 2023. Yeah, and that was a big difference from the consensus uh, of blue chip economists, wasn't it? It was. It was, it was higher than our expectations as well. And so, you know, thinking about our forecast, uh, this puts additional headwinds in terms of the U.S. economy. It means interest rates are probably going to go up even higher, um, which is going to make the recession potentially more acute and longer lasting than we had expected. But we have to dig into the numbers a little bit more to try to get you know, what, what the new estimates are going to look like. You know, the, the Fed has an unenviable job of trying to bring recession down, and they, they've used the 2% threshold, as you said, as, as their target rate. But they also want unemployment to, to stay relatively low. This time, what they said, and I, I'm not sure, you know, tell us about it, their historical um, uh, comments on this, but this time they said 
they prioritized it, didn't they? They, they said that the inflation level, the 2% inflation level was the most important thing and they were willing to accept collateral damage or pain. In other words, they're willing to accept a higher unemployment and a, high, a lower GDP le level in order to achieve that inflation. So that was a really strong statement. I think what they think is it's the lesser of two evils. They don't want to do either one. You know, you don't want to have to put people out of work, but you also need to give price stability. And in the Fed's mind, inflation is sufficiently bad right now that they're willing to, to have to forego some, some pain uh, in, in terms of the labor market, which is already extremely tight right now, uh, to try to arrest inflation and get things back under control again. Because if they don't, you know, the medicine to try to, um, to, try to bring inflation down if it's if it goes into 2024 and 2025, you know it, it it's just more and more medicine that's going to be more and more damaging to the economy, more and more painful for U.S. consumers. So it, it's really just better to really attack it now uh, with everything that you can to try to bring it uh, under control as as quickly as you can. Well, and that's because of how different. I mean, you talked about this being you know a job pull recovery, and we've never seen that before. You have, we have 11 million job openings out there. So, you know, as a former CEO of, you know, multinational companies, that to me looks like a lot of open positions because, you know, if, if you, those are open positions in companies, I mean, those, that's where the 11 million comes from. It's just an aggregate. So that's a lot of open positions that you can eliminate before you start eliminating filled positions and, and actually impacting people who have jobs, right? And that's a, that's why you're talking about in terms of a job full and a less painful uh, approach to this recession. Uh, that, that's right. I mean, the first thing as a CEO, you know much better than I do, but you're going to cut job openings as opposed to people who have actually started working for you. So, you know, that's something I think to watch carefully uh, is looking at the, the number of jobs that are out there, you know, the extent to which companies are trying to recruit as an indicator in, in, in terms of, you know, what, what the economy and what the labor market may, may look like in, into 2023. Well, and that's why Chair Powell and the FOMC has said, we can be a little more aggressive on the interest rate side because we can essentially, he didn't say it quite this way, these are my terms, but you can, you've got all these, this really tight labor market, you've got a lot of room here before you hit a painful situation. So let's do be aggressive and try to fix the inflation situation. No, absolutely. And if you look at the SEP, you know, there is an uptick in the unemployment rates that are expected by FOMC members, but it's nothing that's, out, you know, completely alarming. It, it, it's still, you know, not, not, not a, a terrible situation. But you're, you did say that the expectations are that it's going to take a couple of years before we get close to the 2% level. So this is a long, you know, as I, you know, I talk about the slow moving train wreck. This is going to be a long, slow freight train. Yeah, it, it does sound like that. You know, we had expected that not even until perhaps 2023, the Fed would achieve its target, but we're hearing from them, you know, no, it could be even longer than that. What do you think the worst case is, um, you know, as, as you modeled it out, you know, how high could it actually go? And what are some of the other factors that could come into play? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different variables that, that, that are pushing the inflation numbers up, and they've changed over the course of the last couple of years. We've had supply chain snafus that have been problematic. We've had really elevated demand for goods, uh, which has been problematic for inflation. And then, of course, we had the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia, which really pushed up energy and agricultural prices. So, you know, looking forward, it, it's hard to know uh, in terms of how, what the outcome is going to be in Ukraine. Um, so there could be potentially more volatility in the energy market, for instance. Europe is going to have a pretty tough winter uh, in, in that uh, respect. It does look like supply chains are continuing to uh, improve, which, uh, of course, could change if China introduces new COVID-19 lockdowns, for instance. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I think that is a little more uh, fundamental that, that isn't going to change are some of these labor market dynamics, just in terms of uh, demographics, people having retired, the uh, labor force participation rate uh, not having recovered uh, yet, and the wages that, that are associated with that. And so what we're probably going to see is even after the recession is, is a situation where wages continue probably to rise not as fast as they have been recently, uh, but certainly probably faster than they were prior to the pandemic. Uh, and that's going to have inflationary pressures, I think, for a, a longer period of time. Yeah, and we've just done, uh, received the, the new Conference Board's wage survey of over 250 companies 
who um, tell us that the average wage that they're that they're the, the average wage increase that they're planning in their budgets for 2023 is 4.3%. And that's the highest in over 20 years. So, you know, as this continues to move along and as things hopefully begin to moderate, you know, you would hope to see those kind of wage increases also moderate because that's a huge portion of the inflation. No, definitely. Like I said, you know, the, the current situation in terms of a wage inflation is, is you know, very, very unique. Um, and we're not expecting, you know, these kinds of numbers into 2023 and 2024 and beyond, but we still probably think it's going to be a little bit higher than it was in 2019 and then 2018 and, and sort of before the pandemic. Okay, we've talked mostly about the U.S. Don't just just a little bit of commentary on other parts of the world. Let's just do Europe and China. What are we forecasting at the conference board for Europe and China in, in terms of GDP and therefore recession? So the situation in Europe has gotten darker and darker. Uh, again, this a lot of this is associated with what's happening in the Ukraine, uh, Russia cutting off energy supplies to Europe, uh, really uh, uh, astounding inflation rates in various places uh, uh, on the continent. And so our expectations uh, are that we are going to see a, a recession uh, pretty soon uh, in Europe, and it'll run into 2023. In terms of China, uh, we've been seeing a variety of, of uh, issues uh, in that uh, country as well. Um, they range from uh, big issues in terms of property prices and a lot of anxiety about uh, the property market sort of falling apart, which is a pretty important part of the economy. Uh, but also, you know, their policies on COVID-19 have not really evolved much, really, since the onset of the pandemic. They have what's called the dynamic zero COVID policy, which essentially means that they will shut down entire cities uh, to try to squash uh, uh, the virus, as opposed to, for instance, what we've done here in the U.S., you know, try to sort of live with the virus, uh, get as many people vaccinated as possible uh, and, and come up with treatments. China's trying to do those things as well, but it just hasn't, hasn't had the same levels of success. And so what we're looking at for China uh, is a slowdown as well. Uh, we're not expecting uh, necessarily a, a contraction in growth, but given the high levels of growth that China is accustomed to, something you know, bordering two to three percent growth in any given year is going to feel a bit like a recession for, for most of the people who live there. Yes, because, you know, it's been running, you know, their GDP growth rate, you know, used to run a 6% and, you know, it's been running four or 5%. So you're right. I mean, if it goes down to 2%, that's not technically a recession, but wow, that's a lot. That's even more pain than if the U.S. goes into recession from where it was. The, de the change, the delta in the GDP is even more painful there, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, China, the U.S., the Europe, all together is over half, I think, the world's GDP. What is, if you total up the global GDP, are we forecasting a global recession? Not yet. Uh, we're, we're close, but, but not yet. Things are slowing down. We do expect global GDP to slow down. But there are different metrics for sort of gauging what constitutes a quote unquote, global recession. Uh, typically, uh, uh, the metric that we've gravitated towards is a sustained period of growth below 2%. Um, and we're not forecasting uh, global GDP growth to fall below that level, despite what's happening in the US and in Europe and the slowdown in China. That having been said, if things do worsen materially in any of those three economies, or we see softness in other parts of the world that we don't currently uh, uh, see yet, uh, we could certainly cross into that, that sub 2% level, which would sort of trigger the, the global recession uh, label. Okay, so to wrap it up, no global recession, However, a short, hopefully br brief, shallow recession in the United States, also in Europe, a big slowdown in China, but no recession there. And hence, central banks, including the US Fed, are going to continue to raise interest rates in order to help ameliorate the situation. It sounds to me, Eric, like a slow moving freight train in spades. I wish I had better news, Steve, but it could be worse. Eric, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. It's great to be on. Thank you very much, Steve. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader in their field to discuss the issues of our time. We'll cover topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, environmental social governance, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues. 
share them with your neighbors, your children, your grandchildren, your pets. Everybody will want to listen to our podcast. This series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation for over 100 years. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side. Just visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, your indispensable guide through the global recession, located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.